at least 21 people in Florida are believed to have died in Oregon, Ian, and more than 2 million homes and businesses in the state are left without power a day after the hurricane barreled through the state. Emergency crews are scrambling to reach trapped residents along the state's Gulf Coast as a resurgent Oregon, Ian, veers towards the Carolinas after cutting a path of destruction across Florida, leaving behind deadly floodwaters downed power lines and widespread damage. U.S. President Joe Biden warned on Thursday that Ian could prove to be the deadliest hurricane in Florida's history, saying that preliminary reports suggested a substantial loss of life. We have 12 unconfirmed fatalities. In uh, Charlotte County, we have eight unconfirmed fatalities in Collier County, we have one confirmed fatality in, um, in Polk County. So that brings us up to 21 total. We do have an identified situation uh, that was done during the hasty search um, of, of some fatalities. Um, we do not know exactly how many were in the house. And, and let me paint the picture for you. The water was up over the rooftop. Right, but we had a Coast Guard rescue swimmer swim down into it, and he could identify that it appeared to be uh, human remains. We do not know exactly how many. We do not know what the situation is, and before we comment on that, we you know we want to be transparent, but we just don't know that number. And we got a couple of other situations where we had that particular type situation. So everything that I want to talk about right now is about that search, secure, and stabilize. So. We continue to have uh, our fire uh, rescue partners, search and rescue, going in there and uh, conducting the uh, what we call the hasty search, and then they're coming back and do their primary search, and then they'll do a secondary search. So uh, again, I think it's very important for everybody to know that as a part of the search and rescue element, over a 72-hour period, there's actually three searches that are conducted. That hasty search is just very quick, see if they see any uh, survivors that are alive or in a traumatic situation, and they start to move those individuals to safety. That's been conducted. Now we're back in that primary search area, which is now we're doing a little more detailed search, and then we'll do a second search behind that. Meanwhile, residents of Florida are counting the cost after Ian left behind a trail of destruction in the state that left many homeless. You know, when you first experience all this, it really is um, sort of numbing. You're overwhelmed. You're still in a little bit of shock. It's not my first hurricane, but it's my first total loss. So I'm trying to be brave. Um, I pretty much, I think I've lost everything I own and I'm trying to be brave and know that my family and I are safe and I'll worry about all that other stuff later. So when you lock up after a hurricane, you kind of, and you're evacuating, you kind of say goodbye to your stuff because it may not be there when you get back. Usually it is, but this time no. So that's, you know, I'm not the only one with a loss. This whole community is devastated and um, we're just going to move on and start a new chapter. That's all we can do. The water came up to about here and when it got to there, the way they were saying on the news, I thought it was going to eventually go over our heads. I called my daughters and said goodbye. Uh, now, from now on, when they say water surge and all that, it's not that it's going to be close to the, to the beach. It can be miles away, you know, so next time we'll know to, help, to get the hell out, you know, so, yeah. Live and learn, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. My poor brother, he was booked at a hotel and went to go to the hotel and they uh, had canceled, the, canceled because of the, so he had no place to go. So he's way down at the other end, stuck in his place with four or five people down there. And luckily, luckily so far, everybody I know has made it. Yeah, yeah. All right. The VOAZ Akapo Lizzy is in Tampa, Florida. He joins us now on the program. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Just give us an idea of the situation uh, on ground now where you are. 
Good afternoon. This is the calm after the storm. Actually, now this is a slowly uh, recovery, but at the same time, we know that 12 people have already lost their lives, while 700 people were rescued in the last uh, hours. Uh, now it's Friday and Florida is free from uh, the impact of uh, Ian. But at the same time, now people are trying to get back to their lives. Uh, it's not going to be easy, especially because uh, it's hard. The damages were crazy, very, very high damages, especially not here in Tampa. Tampa was spared by the strength of the hurricane. But in the south, in Fort Myers, uh, people have lost uh, everything. And now the government, the local, federal, the state is trying to help them, them with everything they can. And we know that millions uh, of Florida homes and businesses have no um, electricity at the moment and some homes and areas have been left submerged. For those who have been displaced, what help is being provided for them? Yeah, we are seeing two million and a half people without electricity. So especially the Florida's government is giving food, water, electricity, gas. It was very hard here until today to find gas. It was very hard. So they are trying to restore the internet, at least so people can use the phone to get messages from the authorities. So uh, they are trying to do everything. Joe Biden, the president in the White House, Washington, uh, gave money, like um, establish a plan, a disaster plan for a, a disaster of these dimensions. So also Washington is sending money, help, aid, and from all over Florida, other uh, counties are sending uh, firefighters, police, uh, boats to continue rescue people and bring some relief. Well, Ian is now said to be approaching uh, South Carolina. Speak to us about that. Is it expected to cause as much damage as it has done in Florida? Well, here the hurricane was uh, a shy category five. So here, for example, Fort Myers disappeared. There is no more a pound there. Now in Georgia, we're at category one. Over Florida, Ian became a tropical storm. But then in the Atlantic waters, uh, he gained again uh, power, strength, and now he's going to hit this afternoon, uh, Washington time, uh, not Georgia, but Charlotte, South Carolina. South Carolina. So it's going to be powerful uh, with flooding, inundations, uh, but you know, it's not going to be the same as what happened here. Still, uh, authorities uh, declare the emergency for uh, South and North Carolina, Georgia, and they are preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. All right, then, VOA's Aikapoluzi, thank you so much for the update, and do stay safe. And moving on now, a suicide attack at a tuition center in the Afghan capital, Kabul, has killed at least 19 people, most of them female students. That's according to police and witnesses. Nearly 30 others were injured at the Kaj Education Center in the Dashte Barchi area in the west of the city. Students had been sitting a practice university exam when the bomber struck. No group has yet claimed the attack. Many of those in the area are minority Azaras who have often been targeted by Islamic State militants. Some reports say the number of dead is far higher than Taliban officials have acknowledged. Australia has announced it will end its compulsory five-day home isolation for COVID-infected people on October the 14th. It's one of the country's last remaining restrictions from the pandemic era. The decision to let COVID-positive Australians decide whether they need to isolate or not comes about a month after the quarantine period was cut from seven to five days. Australia, one of the most heavily vaccinated countries against COVID-19, has given two doses to 96.5% of those older than 16, although just under 72% have had the booster shot. 
we have agreed uh, today that we will end, uh, states and territories will end their respective mandatory isolation requirements on the 14th of October. Uh, the pandemic leave disaster payments will end at that time as well, with the exception of uh, people in high risk settings uh, which uh, need to be uh, given particular support. So aged care, health care, uh, the measures, uh, disability care, uh, the areas that have been previously identified. Uh, it recognises that we are in a very low transmission community transmission uh, phase of the pandemic here in Australia. It does not in any way suggest that the pandemic is finished. Uh, we will almost certainly see uh, future peaks of the virus um, uh, into the future as we have seen uh, earlier in this year. However, at the moment, we have very low rates of, of uh, both cases, hospitalisations, uh, intensive care uh, admissions, aged care outbreaks and various other measures that we've been uh, following very closely in our weekly um, uh, open report. Now, cancer is a disease impact in the world. According to the World Health Organization, cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide, accounting for nearly 10 million deaths in 2020. The health organization also records that approximately 70% of deaths from cancer occur in low and middle income countries. But is there hope? Uh, well, there is hope as member states of the IAEA converge on the Vienna International Conference Center discussing the role of nuclear science and collaboration in fighting the disease. Our correspondent, Millicent Walker, reports. It's the scientific forum of the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, here, brainstorming uh, the best uh, use of deploying uh, nuclear science for cancer, using radiation medicine, among others. Globally, there has been a continuous rise in the incidence of cancers, especially in low- and middle-income countries, including Nigeria, and recommended interventions for preventing cancer and other non-communicable diseases have not been adequately implemented. Treatment remains inaccessible. The problems that we have According to the IAEA DG, cancer is a more silent killer than well, COVID itself and says the big challenge for the international organization uh, is federating the opportunities and, uh, to solving the problem. Big challenge for us in international organizations is how to um, uh, federate the efforts, um, how to make sure that the science that exists that the technology that we know is available and the funds that may be, um, um, of course, um, out there can converge into uh, solving uh, this, this real problem. And this is um, what uh, Race of Hope um, is all about. The disparity is particularly grave in Africa, where nearly 70% of countries have reported that radiotherapy is generally not available to their populations. And for the US government, this is unacceptable. The raging inequality of care is unacceptable. If we can bring together resources clearly, but also experts in healthcare and health policy and security and development from all over the world, we can marshal these resources that are needed to improve and expand crucial radiotherapy technology. But Nigeria is taking a unique step on nuclear technology solutions, with the Nigeria Atomic Energy Commission and other ministries leading this national response on comprehensive strategy to guide cancer prevention and control. There are so much challenge in the country in terms of state of affairs in cancer treatment and cancer management using nuclear technology. We have before tried to put LINAC and gamma cameras on other machines in some of our tertiary hospitals. I think we want to start gradually and then approach it in that manner. Uh, one experience, one lesson from one region to another until the country is sufficient enough with those facilities. For the IAEA and member states, it is a moral responsibility 
on the need for commitment and compromise of political leaders around the world. Having cancer isn't easy, but choosing to dedicate resources, expertise and life-saving treatments is what the IAEA, the Nigeria Atomic Energy Commission, as well as other member states are deciding to do with this initiative, Rays of Hope, Cancer Care for All. From the Vienna International Conference Center, Millicent Walker for Channels Television News. Nigeria has requested the International Atomic Energy Agency to implement programs on nuclear power, its expansion, and enhancing nuclear power plants in developing countries. The Minister of State Foreign Affairs Ambassador Zviru Dada made the comments at the 66th General Conference of the IAEA, taking place in Vienna, Australia. According to Austria, I beg your pardon, according to him, there are notable milestones of the peaceful use of nuclear energy in areas like Africa agriculture, nuclear medicine, food security, among others. He recognized the agency's commitment to coordinating member state activities despite the COVID-19 pandemic and the global economic crisis. We wish to seize this opportunity to request the agency to increase the number of projects and programs implemented in member states in line with their needs to achieve the most desired goals and purposes. Nigeria also calls the attention of the agency to the non-implementation of some national programs and activities in my country, namely senior management training and integrated management system in nuclear power plants projects, as well as licensing application in the construction phase, to mention but a few. We call on the uh, IAEA to implement them as soon as possible. Nigeria takes note of the cross-cutting projects of the agency, namely Maris, Maris Klodowska Curry Fellowship Program, Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action, Zodiac, Nuclear Technology for Controlling Plastic Pollution, New Tech Plastics, Rays of Hope, Cancer Care, as well as other initiatives of the agency and express our support for the agency in this regard. My delegation requests the agency to ensure full implementation of the programs on nuclear power, including launching new nuclear power programs, enhancing nuclear power plants, and expansion of nuclear power programs, especially in the developing member states. Mr. President, my delegation take also takes note of the aspect of the report on non-power nuclear applications to enhance human health through radiotherapy, radio stop uh, production and radiation technology for medicines, agricultural products and food security, as well as improving supply of water resources and the use of nuclear technology to solve environmental pollutions. This is another milestone of peaceful use of nuclear technology or energy. EU countries have disagreed about whether and how to cap runaway gas prices, with Germany among those opposing the measure that 15 other states say is needed to tackle Europe's energy crunch. Meeting in Brussels today, ministers from the 27 EU member states approved levies on energy firms' windfall profits to try to contain an energy price surge aggravated by Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, uh, the agreement covers a uh, levy on fossil fuel company surplus profits made this year or next. Another levy on excess revenues low-cost power producers make from soaring electricity costs and a mandatory 5% cut in electricity use during peak price periods. will generate about 140 billion euros. And personally, I believe we could impose a price cap on all Russian imported gas, including LNG. However, some member states see this as a sanction, and we don't yet have a consensus on this step, how to limit Russia's ability to finance the war on Ukraine. While views differ across the member states, there is also common ground. We all agree that the market is not working normally, and intervention is necessary, that we need effective measures that preserve our security of supply, 
and are accompanied by a strong commitment to demand reduction. Well, there is definitely uh, uh, 15 countries which believes, you know, that the price cap uh, um, is the proper way uh, uh, to go. However, we see uh, really uh, technical differences uh, even within the approaches of, of, uh, of, of the single countries. And, uh, and uh, of course, we ask the Commission to put together, I can call it an expert group, in order to evaluate uh, the positive and negative impacts uh, of all options we have. Well, this comes as two natural gas pipelines in the Baltic Sea are currently leaking, and analysts believe Russian attacks are to blame. Well, Lars Holter in Berlin, the DW's Lars, uh, joins us now with to tell us the latest. Lars. Yeah, first there was one leak, then it was two, three, and now we have found a fourth uh, leak in the Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2 pipelines and four leaks at the same time in pipelines that have so far really worked without a glitch, at least one of them. That is not only highly suspicious, but it makes it very clear to security experts that has to be sabotage. And especially since seismometers have detected explosions in the area, strong explosions right around where those leaks have occurred. Obviously, with the state of current affairs, everything is pointing to Russia, and that's also what the EU says, and they are now once again preparing new sanctions against Russia. Now, for some background here, Nord Stream is a gas pipeline that has been delivering natural gas from Russia to Germany for over 10 years. It opened in 2011. Nord Stream 2, however, is a different story that has only recently been finished, and then due to the war in Ukraine, it was never even opened. But... It was still filled with gas, and that is for technical reasons. And that is also why the leak was even detected, because even the unused pipeline was letting gas out into the water. All leaks, by the way, are in Danish and in Swedish waters, and those waters had to be closed off for all shipping. Well, what does it all mean for the gas market, considering that a shortage of gas has already caused a major energy crisis in Germany and other countries? Well, looking at the gas markets in Europe, this has virtually no effect at all. And that's because, as I said, Nord Stream 2 was never even opened anyway. And Nord Stream 1 had been shut down by Russia 2 a couple of weeks ago. Initially, Russia had said that that was for technical reasons and that they needed a new turbine. But it had already been clear to the West that that was not really the true problem and that Moscow was simply responding to sanctions against the country by uh, turning off the spigot here. However, one thing seems clear, an attack on these pipelines leads to panic in the gas markets and that, of course, leads to potentially higher gas prices and maybe that is all Russia wanted to achieve here. And what about the environmental side of this story? How big a problem are the gas leaks? Well, that might be one of the bigger problems here, too. The leaks are expected to let gas out for at least another week. All in all, there's around 500 million cubic meters of methane that are expected to bubble up in the Baltic Sea. And methane is 25 times more destructive to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And the emissions uh, from the leak could be as much altogether as the emissions of all of Germany for two weeks. However, scientists have said now that the seawater is likely to absorb a large part of the methane and uh, that it would not very, be very dangerous to sea life. In fact, if there is any environmental fallout for the sea, it would be likely rather local and not impact sea life in the entire Baltic Sea. All right, then DW's Lars Halter, thank you so much for the update. Moving on now, the Royal Mint has unveiled the official coin effigy of Britain's new King Charles. The first coins to bear the King's portrait are a special £5 crown and the reverse of a 50 pence coin commemorating the life of Queen Elizabeth II. It was created by British sculptor Martin Jennings from a photograph and was personally approved by the new King. In keeping with tradition, the portrait of Charles faces in the opposite 
opposite direction of that of his mother, Chris Baker, information and research manager at the Royal Mint, says Jennings had managed to achieve a real warmth and humanity in the portrait of King Charles III. What he's managed to achieve is a real warmth and humanity to bring in, the, bring in to the portrait of Charles. And it's a little bit different to what you might have got with Queen Elizabeth II, particularly her first coinage portrait from the 1950s, where it was very idealised. This is much more humane in regards to Charles. It's much more the man himself. And you're also seeing the age of Charles coming across in a dignified and graceful way. So there's a tradition on British coinage that the way the monarch faces should alternate by reign. And that's a very long tradition that goes all the way back to Charles II. This coin follows that tradition. And Charles III has followed that tradition. And you will see him facing the opposite way to his mother on his coinage. So we're in a pretty unusual situation now in terms of the British coinage, partly because of the longevity of the Queen's reign, but also because of decimalisation. So because of decimalisation, the only coinage we've got in circulation bears Her Majesty the Queen's portrait. However, prior to decimalisation in 1971, there would have been a mix of monarchs in active circulation. So in the 1960s, it wouldn't be unthought of to come across a portrait of Queen Victoria. And we today at the Royal Mint will not be actively removing all of the coinage of Elizabeth. It will stay in circulation to the end of its active circulating life, which is you know, a good 20 to 30 years. So for many decades to come, we'll still see Elizabeth in active circulation. And finally on the programme, South Africa and South Korea are celebrating 30 years of friendship. And as part of that, a group of young men have been touring South Africa, spreading the message of inclusion through music. Formed in 2015, Dream with Ensemble is an 11-member group which has won hearts and awards around the world with their musical skills, despite what would have been described as their challenges. Well, we caught up with them at the Nelson Mandela Foundation in Johannesburg. The group played a number of crowd favorites at the Nelson Mandela Foundation in Johannesburg. This one, Africa, by the group Toto, they say, is a tribute to global icon Nelson Mandela. Dream With Ensemble is a South Korean group which holds concerts to raise awareness about disabilities through music. The award-winning group of 11 comprises members with developmental challenges and with their music they say, when prejudice sleeps, may the heart hear music. <laughs> Four City Tour of South Africa has seen them perform with groups like the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. They also played in Durban and in Pretoria for the country's Heritage Day celebrations the past weekend. Here in Johannesburg, they shared a stage with the Sibonile School for the Blind. <laughs> I think uh, we can expand our, you know, the bilateral relations and exchanges in the, uh, you know, the especially cultural centers sector, and then also, you know, the especially in the area of uh, disabilities. So I think this is uh, only a starting point of our further engagement in the artist between our two countries in, in terms of our disability. The message, according to the organizers, is to spread the message of inclusion of persons with disabilities far and wide, especially in the rural areas. In terms of ensuring that these activities do take place in rural areas and in communities and everywhere where we are, is there is actually all of our responsibility. However, I must indicate that already they are taking place. What we short of is actually a, a participation of society whenever these particular engagements happen in our localities. I think there's a lot we can do which we are not doing at the moment uh, to try bridge the gap. 
um, between uh, ourselves and people with, with disabilities. You know, you, you look at um, how people are treated when they have particularly uh, developmental challenges. Um, they are treated in a particular way. The people stare at them. People um, uh, uh, kind of uh, look at them in a way that suggests that they are not normal. Dream with Ensemble, whose tour of South Africa is part of the celebration of 30 years of friendship between South Africa and their country, has now returned home to South Korea. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. And that's the program. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyo Latwe Tayo. Have a lovely weekend.